So this is the day after the Uvalde shooting. All of our hearts are breaking. Everyone's asking what could be done to prevent this and what can be done going forward. We'll be talking to a leading national expert next. Many are predicting that the worst is yet to come, which is unfortunate, said one person here. Until now, they've enjoyed the reputation of being the nation's icebox. Watched a burglar in his home this morning by webcam. As a journalist of over 25 years, stories are what make my world turn. Reporting live from the Dallas Newsroom tonight, Jeff Crilly, Fox 4 News. But in 2008, I took the jump from my familiar life and started a PR firm from my home. We're talking about anyone with a camcorder like the one I'm using becomes a television network. We started slowly growing the company and we now have over a hundred clients and we've branched into the world of live digital broadcasting. I now own eight different TV studios and have a huge team. And the stories that I now get to share are sometimes the most important of my life. Life has a funny way of coming around full circle. This is the Jeff Crilly Show. So the nation's heart is breaking right now because of what happened in Uvalde. Uh, a young man goes in, guns down uh, dozens of students. Uh, what could be done to prevent this? No one has the full answer, but a man who has some insights is John Harold. He's with the Determined People podcast. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Jeff. Glad to be here. Well, let's talk a little bit about Rachel's Challenge because that's why you're on the show today. You're the chairman of the board of Rachel's, Rachel's Challenge. The board of directors, correct. Yeah. So Rachel's Challenge was was actually birthed after a tragedy similar to what happened in Uvalde. Uh, everybody, if I say the words, where were you when Columbine occurred, everybody knows. So after Columbine, uh, Daryl Scott, who was the, Rachel Scott's father, she was the first child killed at Columbine. Uh, Daryl and Sandy, his wife, Rachel's stepmom, took that horrific event, unthinkable event, that pain, and turned it into purpose. And they launched an organization in the early 2000s called Rachel's Challenge. And it's the largest in-school program in the world, which focuses on kindness and compassion, changing the culture of schools, making them more connected. Yes. And that's part of the dialogue that I think needs to happen right now as a country, because everybody's talking about gun control and school uh, security and, and other things. But you're right. The root is kindness. And I have to tell you, uh, doing research research for this show, I found a clip from you in CBS New York mm -hmm. four years ago. It's as if you did it yesterday. Let's go ahead and roll that clip. Well, from churches to schools, abuse and bullying are two things that seem more and more prevalent across our country and in our schools. Statistics show nearly 200,000 children skip school every day because of fear of bullying. But the fight to change that is not easy. John Harrell is an author and victim of childhood abuse. He also works uh, on the he's the chairman of the board of an organization called Rachel's Challenge. And he's here to tell us more about the work that you do and how parents really can play more of a role mm -hmm. also. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you. I'm honored to be here. And so let's first talk about Rachel Joy Scott, who this organization is named after the first um, child killed in, I shouldn't say teenager, killed during Columbine. Well, she was a child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ch yeah. So t tell us a little bit about her and, and how her legacy lives on through this. Sure. Thank you. Rachel was a normal 17-year-old girl, like a lot of kids, with ups and downs like they have. However, she was a, a unique child. And her Dad, Daryl, and stepmom, Sandy, really didn't know this about her until after her death. Rachel reached out to three different groups of kids at school. Kids who were new to school, kids who were getting picked on, and special needs students. And she didn't care about being popular, she cared about making an impact. She wrote a paper about two months before her death called My Ethics, My Codes of Life. And in that paper, she wrote, I have this theory that if one person goes out of their way to show compassion, it will start a chain reaction of the same. You never know how far a little kindness can go. And so the Rachel's Challenge, the organization, has been, her, Rachel's story has been seen and experienced by over 29 million people worldwide. Sadly, 20, you know, 17-year-olds die every day. This one continues on. Mm -hmm. So it, it's... Her story was, was not, her death was not in vain. Her, her death has, there's so much good that's come out of it. We get letters, Facebook messages from kids every year, hundreds of them, kids who are going to take their own lives until they heard Rachel's story. And these stories, what you do, Rachel's Challenge goes to different schools and also even different colleges and businesses and teaches her kind of chain of kindness. Mm -hmm. Tell us, you know, when you say Rachel's Challenges, what are some of the challenges? Sure. 
be kind to others, mm -hmm. you know, lead with compassion. Um, don't be prejudiced. Eliminate prejudice uh, because you know prejudice means that you prejudge somebody. You know, when I when I give inspirational speeches, uh, it's not about Rachel's challenge, but other things. I always ask people. So, anybody have people that bring out the best in you, and you'll raise your hand and say, "Do you ever have somebody that brings out the worst in you?" And I say, "Don't look at them, but mm -hmm. raise your hand." And the truth is, that person you may not even know them well, but they remind you of someone who you did not care for, they did not treat you kindly. So you can prejudge. And I just, I, I believe we need to eliminate prejudgment and just take people as they are and, and look for the good in others. I mean, that's one of her challenges. Look for the good in others. Sometimes you have to look pretty hard to find good in some people. Mm -hmm. But if, if we can connect with others, truly look and see the heart of somebody, not, the, not don't try to be unified with them or, or un, unity and diversity are actually more divisive than anything else try to genuinely connect with somebody look at the heart of that person see them for who they are not who they may want you to see that, that they are but who mm -hmm. they truly are then we connect with those people and I think that can go a long way to to cure a lot of the divisiveness our world is experiencing what is your advice for parents you write about how you were abused by your father when you were younger but and you all, yeah and you also you you sure. but you also say you know it's, it's specifically fathers it's important for them to be in the home what is your advice for parents who might see that their child is a bully or is being bullied get involved don't be afraid to look at your kids for who they are and if they're if they're experiencing if they're demonstrating bullying behavior, there's no real bully. It's just bullying behavior. And the bully is the most scared person in the room. Find out why. You know, get involved. Talk with them. Listen to them, more importantly. See, any child and any adult needs to know you care. If you show, if you can capture the heart of a child, they'll give you everything else. But talk to them. Let them know you care. Fatherless homes is the worst malady that we have in our in, our, in all three major demographics. It is horrible for, for whites, African Americans, and Hispanics. Fatherless homes, 69% of youth suicides are kids from fatherless homes. 75% of rapists are kids from fatherless homes. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean single parents. Mm -hmm. It means kid, you know some boy, I won't call him a man, some boy fathers a child and then abandons that child. And this is the, this is the result of what happens there. So you've got to get involved. Don't don't turn your don't turn a blind eye and it, think it's not my family because right. it happens mm -hmm. to everyone. Don, thank you so much for being here and thank sharing you. your yeah. story and also Rachel's story in the organization. Thank mm -hmm. you, I appreciate it. I'm very and honored. Thank you for being here, John. It's so eerie because it's as if that was recorded yesterday. Uh, we're talking about the very same thing today. What needs to happen in schools to make a difference? A lot of things. First of all, I would say bring prayer back in school. You know, it's not that saying a 30 second prayer that's a rote written out something every day is going to change the heart of somebody, but at least they have the presence of God, presence of mind to know there is a creator who is in much bigger than all of us. Second thing is what we've seen with Rachel's Challenge, when they have presenters go to those schools, those schools become better connected. Kids start seeing each other for who they are. They're actual stories of the high school quarterback, the star, the guy with the pepsodent smile and the big shoulders connects with the five foot tall thespian because they allow their guard to come down. They both go home to alcoholic fathers and they realize we're not as different as we may appear to be on the outside. We've got to get that connection. Even the CDC says connection with the other, other human beings is, it, it has a direct correlation on reducing suicide rates, improving health, improving the, uh, the, the connection with, with other people in the schools. It's just, it's just, it's what we have to do. We're so much of the TikTok and Snap generation now. Sure. We need to, to actually sit down and have conversations like you and I are doing, just talk to each other and listen to each other. And we're just learning uh, little bits about what might have been on going on in the home of the, of the shooter in Uvalde, and we're hearing uh, bullying played a role. You know something about bullying. You wrote a book. Uh, and I, I want you to talk about this, killing my father and then finding him. Tell us about that. Okay, I didn't kill my dad. Okay. <laughs> it's a metaphor for yes. killing the voices of doubt, worthlessness, insecurity uh, that both my parents actually gave me. I put father because as a man, I relate more to the male role model, which I did not have a male role model. So killing my father is a metaphor for killing those voices and, do, and actually being able to, to forgive my parents for who they, who they were, seeing them for who they were. And you do that through practicing gratitude. We talk about this in the book and how it really changes your, the, the biochemistry of your brain in a good way. 
then finding him is the spiritual piece of it. So when I was a teenager, I was angry teenager. You'd never know it. My friends from high school still can't believe I wrote the book and, and told all, but I said, you weren't ever angry. You were just a guy that everybody liked. And, and I was pretty well liked by most people, all groups of, of kids, but I hid it. I'd go home at night and I was alone and I was just, just, I hated my life, hated my parents, hated my existence, hated God. And I told him on a regular basis, but then finding him is the spiritual piece of it. And actually, you know, atheists can read this book. I didn't write it for just Christians. I wrote it for everybody to find forgiveness for those that have harmed them. And I, what I learned was that when I was dying inside as a, as a kid, dying, God was hurting right with me when I thought he was punishing me. But it's taken time to, for me to understand and realize that and come to peace with that. And so I write about forgiveness in the book. I had to forgive my parents, which I, I did. They were both dead long after, long, long before I forgave them. I had to forgive myself. And I had to forgive God. As weird as that sounds, the great forgiver, I had to forgive him for putting me in that family when I thought I should be in the family down the street. But he's used it for great purpose. One quick aside I'll tell you. Um, Growing up in that violent, crazy home has given me credibility to go in and speak to kids in detention centers. And I walk into that audience, there's 100 kids in there, they're all black or Mexican, they don't look like me, I'm two gener generations older. And I'll start off the same way, I said, you know, I can read your mind. You're thinking, what, what could I possibly have in common with this older, extremely good looking white man? <laughs> and they laugh. But Jeff, if you can get a kid who is so scared to laugh, their guard comes down just a little, but that's all I need to punch him right in the heart. Mm. And I start off talking about my dad, how you'd love my dad if you met him, but he also put me in the hospital when I was six months old. And I tell that story. And within about two or three minutes of me sharing my life story of what it was like growing up in that home, all the skin color difference, the age difference, it all just melts away and they see me as one of them. Wow. It's the most gratifying thing I get to do. And I wouldn't be credible going in there if I had not lived that life story. And also, I don't charge any detention center or, or foster home to go in and do that. I do it because I've been given the story, and I love sharing the story and seeing kids change. I want to talk about your video podcast because you're really changing lives in a very positive way through your podcast. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. Sure. So the Determined People podcast, if you go to YouTube, you have to type in the Determined People podcast. If you type my name in, you won't find anything. You might find some videos of somebody took of me that I don't remember, but, <laughs> but uh, you have to type it in. And I would appreciate if people would subscribe. I'm trying to get to over 1,000 subscribers because the dynamics change them. Sure. It is about the story behind the outward success we see. We always see people that have done great things, maybe a doctor, an engineer, a college professor or something. But we don't know the hellish times they had to go through to get there to persevere to stay determined because they wanted something. I have this belief that you can do anything you want to. How badly do you want to do it? When my kids, I have sons that are 28 and 26 now, but when they were growing up, I would not allow them to use the word can't. Just say, I won't, because that's what it means. You can do anything. You may not want to, but the word can't cannot be, it's the worst four-letter word in the English language. So the story is about, I mean, I'm sorry, the stories of the podcast are the stories behind the outward success their backgrounds, how they came there. And there's some fascinating stories of people from, you know, Stacey Johnson, who has learning disabilities, was in foster care from two years old, emancipated out. And then today she now has a foster home for 13 kids. And she is changing the world of foster care. But, but she now has Grace 365. Her organization is Central Texas Table of Grace. She has Grace 365, which takes kids that have aged out of foster care, but they're not ready to be adults yet. She teaches a life skills program to them. She has homes for them. They have to work 20 hours per week, and she has requirements they have to do to, to get funding for it, but she's, she has to raise money for this all the time, mm -hmm. and she's doing it. Her life is a true miracle. Her, Octavius Bishop, had so many, so many learning disabilities, he probably couldn't tell an analog watch, right? Yet... In the fall of, I believe it was 2018, he sat for and, and defended his doctoral dissertation. He is now Dr. Octavius Bishop. He still has anxiety. He still has those learning disabilities, but he didn't let it stop him. If through the intervention of one man in his life, who I believe, and he believes, God put there, he, he did the work, but it was hell to go from you know, being in eighth and ninth, ninth grade at a fourth grade reading comprehension level, and then being in, in AP classes as a junior and senior in high school. He had to do it. These are the stories I bring to life. 
It's not about the success. We don't talk about that so much. We, we talk about what they're, what they're doing with their lives. But we tell the story of this, what went on behind the scenes. And I applaud you for that, John, because so much of the news that we see is negative because in, you know, I was a news reporter. If it bleeds, it leads. And so they're driven mm -hmm. by ratings and advertisers that are telling them what they can talk about. On your show, you can talk about whatever you want to talk about. And I pull for the underdog. I mean, uh, the former lobbyist, Jack Abramoff, is an acquaintance of mine. And, you know, he went to prison for 43 minutes. There's still people that would love to see him rot in prison. The man paid his, paid his price, and he's not a bad guy. He owned up to the mistakes he made. The funny thing is, on his, on his book, uh, uh, it, <laughs> normally on the back of a book or something, or inside cover, they'll put reviews by people. You know, don't, don't miss this. It's a great read, whatever. He put statements by members of Congress who were just vilifying him, and he gave every one of them money. So they're such hypocrites, right? But it was, it was I mean, I, I pull for the underdog. I believe in the, in the stories of restoration and redemption. I mean, why do we like those silly Hallmark movies, right? right? It's the same story, but we like them because it has a happy ending. We see the tragedy. We see the bend, bend, bend. It doesn't break and snaps back and everything is restored. Everything's perfect. We want the happy ending to be our story. So that's why I do those do those programs. I'm going to have Daryl on the show when we get him to Austin in the fall. We're going to. I've got so many people that that I want to interview. But have unbelievably cool stories, and my the whole theme of the podcast is bringing encouragement, strength, and hope to a world in desperate need of it. Mm -hmm. My hope is that somebody will see a story, watch the interview, and they'll find themselves in that person's story, and they'll say, "If that person did it, I can too." I love it. John, we're almost out of time, so I want, to, I want you to look into that camera right there. That's the viewer. Give them some words of encouragement on how they can make a difference because, you know, we've got so much stress right now, the, uh, the mm -hmm. pandemic, the uh, economy. Uh, how can people make a difference? Sure. First of all, you've got to do something. You've got to be willing to do something. All of us have unique gifts that were given to us by our Creator, and you've got to be able to go out and use them. I have a gift for public speaking, so I go do it. It's people's number one fear. I don't understand that because number two is death. I don't want to die, but I don't, mind, I don't mind blowing a speech. You've got to be willing to find something that appeals to you. Don't do it as a resume builder. If you have a relative that was close to you that died of heart disease, get involved with the American Heart Association. If cancer is impacted, you get, get, get involved with the American Cancer. Go volunteer at a pediatric hospital if children are your calling. But do something. You get that feeling after you do something for someone that can do nothing to repay you. You get that feeling, which is truly indescribable. And I encourage you to go do it. Turn the TV off. You're not gonna. You're not gonna miss a thing. And sorry, Jeff, being an old news guy, but I don't watch the news. <laughs> no. <laughs> the people no, always say, taken. They say. They say. Well, what if something big happens? Somebody will tell me. Somebody will tell me, and then I'll make the decision on how I want to process it and do what's best for me and for my family. But I encourage you. Just do something. You all have a calling in here. We all do. Do something. You never know. One person can change the world. And it, 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 it takes that first step out in faith. It's not going to be easy. If it's your true calling, it'll be the hardest thing you've ever tried to accomplish. But you will accomplish it because the Creator put that in you, and He doesn't fail. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your ministry with yeah. us. Uh, we're going to end with your website, which is johnharrellauthor.com. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Jeff, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You bet. That's it for now. We'll see you next time.